kids are apparently a little weak. Hello and welcome back to Tinker Talks Guns. By and large, I am not a fan of military rifles that have been sporterized. But this one caught my eye. This is a World War II vintage inland M1 carbine that has been rather thoroughly and quite beautifully worked over. So. Before we get into that, I'd like to thank my supporters on Patreon. This all costs money and your contributions help more than you know. I'd also like to thank channel benefactors who have helped in endless ways from the use of their facilities to providing ammunition to um, allowing me to show you their guns and shoot them. So thank you all. So the M1 carbine was introduced in World War II as a personal defense weapon. And it was well liked. Um, some felt the stopping power was not up to par, but you had 15 rounds, so by and large, they were popular. And we made a crap ton of them. And after the war, they were sold to numerous allied countries, some non allied countries, and to the general public. Which was kind of interesting, because after they had sold tens of thousands of them, the government realized they had done so illegally. Because the National Firearms Act specified that rifles must have a barrel of 18 inches or be registered as a short-barreled rifle. 
Yeah, Moen Carbine does not have an 18-inch barrel. It has a 16-inch and change barrel. And the government quickly went oops. And Congress quickly amended the National Firearms Act to specify that a short-barreled rifle had a barrel less than 16 inches to retroactively make the government's actions legal. But that is neither here nor there. Now, M1 carbines have become highly collectible. And many will view this as a consequence as being an atrocity. I don't. This was made at a time when it was just a cheap rifle that was readily available and why wouldn't you modify it? They were cheap, they were all over the place, and it was a fine, small game, ranch rifle sort of gun. And with the right loads, you can stretch to deer, at least smaller varieties of deer, like the black gels we have here in the Pacific Northwest. So why wouldn't you? You know, of course, they didn't know that 50 years down the line, these would be very collectible. So, this one was done in the late 50s or early 1960s, at least judging by the scope, because that's when the scope was manufactured. And um, <laughs> somewhere I have the details of what this scope is. It was a decent mid-range four-power hunting scope in the late 50s, early 60s. That's really the sound and point, I think. And... Um, the gun is beautifully made. It's very nicely finished. And just um, a world of difference from a lot of surplus military rifles that were sold as sporterized, meaning they simply stripped a bunch of the furniture off them and were cut off the stocks in a brutally ugly fashion. <laughs> This, as you can see, is not at all an ugly rifle. It is, in fact, as I said, beautifully finished. It's a gorgeous piece of wood. And it's been done up as a sort of semi manlicker carbine style that I'm an absolute sucker for. And um, it has been uh, drilled and tapped for a completely different sort of scope mount. This scope mount was a common sort that replaces the rear sight. And, uh, well, it works, but as you saw in the shooting video, some loads the scope gets in the way. Um, almost every jam I've had with this gun was from lower powered loads impacting on the scope and lodging in place rather than ejecting. With military specification factory ammo, it works fine. So I'm going to have to work up some loads for this that do work. And um, because God, who can afford factory ammo these days? 30 carbine ammunition has gotten expensive. Now, 30 carbine, let's talk about that for a second. Again, this is an intermediate or personal defense weapon cartridge. Essentially, it's a pistol caliber. It shoots a... 110 grain jacketed bullet at about 2,000 feet per second. So it's no slouch, but a 30 caliber 110 grain jacketed bullet just only takes you so far. Now, with soft point ammunition or hollow points, as I said, this can be quite effective on small to medium sized game, up to and including smaller breeds of deer and antelope. And Accuracy, if on, a, on a really good day from a rest, about three minutes of angle at 100 yards. This is nobody's idea of a sniper rifle, but it was never meant to be. It's just somebody's, you know, ranch rifle, knockabout rifle, small game rifle. And in that role, it serves perfectly well. Now, this has standard 15-round magazine. 
and I purchased a number of these while it was legal to do so. The bolt does not lock back on empty, but can be manually locked back by the use of this button on the charging handle. So you just push it back, press the button, and it locks in place. Uh, magazine release is here, and the safety is a lever located here. Safe. Fire. Flip it up, which is pretty easy to do with the trigger finger, even for people with much smaller hands than mine. And you're ready to fire. This gun has also been fitted with a very fat trigger shoe and has an over-travel screw inserted in the back of the trigger guard, which works really well. I mean, the trigger on this, it's really quite nice. It breaks about three, three and a half pounds. No over-travel, thank you, over-travel stop screw. And uh, it's just a very pleasant, very nice gun to shoot. And it's pretty handy, and it weighs about six pounds. So it's not excessively heavy. Now, I have to confess, I am tempted to replace the 1950s optic because it's, it was a fine optic in its time. Not so much now. But the thing that impressed me first, other than the fact that it's gorgeous, was that I asked them to show it to me and they brought it out. at Pedro's guns, of course. And I shouldered the gun and it was right there, like it had been made for me. And it's just very, very sweet. And honestly, a couple years ago when I got this gun, I probably paid too much for it. But M1 carbines have gotten bloody expensive. And a sporterized gun like this, so beautifully done, it's worth what someone will pay for it. So from that perspective, I paid the right amount. <laughs> um, you don't often see these. There were some kits available to do exactly this sort of conversion. But this doesn't appear to be any of those. I don't know if it's a kit I haven't tracked down, or if it's a full custom, or what have you. I just know that I really, really like it. And uh, it has had the front sight removed, which, since there's no rear sight, I suppose that's not unreasonable. It almost seems sacrilege to put a more modern optic on it, really. But I would like the utility of a modern optic. We'll see. Now, would I hunt with this gun? For, for Western Washington blacktail deer, if I can get a good 110 grain hollow point load that works, cycles the gun reliably, sure, I would. Because most of my shots, frankly, are 20 to 50 yards. I won't be doing it this year because I'm hunting in a shotgun and handgun only area, but I totally would. <laughs> anyway, so this is one of the apples of my eye and uh, it's just, it's beautiful to look at, delightful to hold, very nice to shoot. What's not to love except the fact that Long before this was a collectible historic artifact, somebody ruined a collectible historic artifact. One man's atrocity is another man's thing of beauty. And this, this is a thing of beauty. And it's just right there. I mean, it's just so, so nice. <laughs> like it was made for me. So anyway, I hope that you've, uh, like the video. If you did, please hit the like button. It really helps the channel. Subscribe if you want to see more content like this. And uh, stay safe, take care, and we'll talk to you again real soon.